Good evening, everybody. This is Three Deep with Wabi. I'm your host, uh, head scratchingly, I guess, since the show is called Three Deep with Wabi. I'm your host, uh, Joe Johnson, owner of PurplePTSD.com, VikingsTerritory.com, PurpleTerritoryRadio.com, and starting next week, a new Minnesota Wild website called MiniIce.com. Stay tuned. For that, uh, the crappy empire extends a little bit further. Uh, Obviously, I'm here with Mr. Mike Wobby Wobshaw. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. How you doing, man? I I can't complain, you know? I mean, I I, I genuinely thought that I didn't care that much about the Vikings anymore. And then we get uh, (laughs) four quarters into that game, and I'm sitting there like... From one angle, it looks like I'm sitting on the couch, but if you go like 45 degrees, I was actually just hovering over it tensely. Um, uh, they, they, man, what, what a, what a crazy game that was. Um, it, it, it's nice to know that uh, the Vikings still can at least excite us if they're, if they're going to disappoint us, at least do it in an exciting way. What did you say? Yeah, um, here's, here's the deal with that. So, like, if you're sitting there watching. If you've seen enough football, you know that really late in the game, um, Seattle was a prohibitive underdog to win that game. Like, their probability of winning the game, like, yeah. I, I know you're going to bring A.J. Monsoor in here in a minute, and he probably knows the exact number, but I'm going to put it at, like, 92% chance the Vikings were going to win the game with, like, a minute and a half to go or whatever. Yeah. It, but but so and this is not even an indictment on the Vikings. This is absolutely 100% all about Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. So this was a very improbable win for Seattle, but they made it look very routine. And that that's what's amazing about Russell Wilson and that entire aura around the Seahawks is they made what was a very improbable win look routine. Yeah, and and, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have a special guest this week. Really, the the way that three deep is going to work is it's going to be me and Wabi each week with a rotating third guest. And our guest this week is none other than uh, AJ Mansoor of of K Fan fame. Uh, the initials. What 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 did you pay me extra money to to say? Uh, the initials master or king of initials or, or something like that. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us, man. If people don't know, you've uh, written for us in the past a few years ago, and now you'll, you're back doing some some Vikings content for us each week, which we appreciate as well. But uh, how are you doing, man? Uh, that's right, man. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Now, Wabi, you said 92%. Yeah, uh, I did. The actual number was sitting at 96%. Oh, my <laughs> okay. God. Yeah. At the moment of the fourth down decision, uh, 96% chance that the Vikings win. If they converted, obviously that bumps up to uh, 100%. And um, if it if they didn't convert, which they didn't, it dropped by 15%. Yeah. Um, so still the prohibitive favorites to win that game, but it did drop by a, a decent chunk. And uh, and clearly we all know what happened. Yeah, yeah it's, but it's the, it'll go for it, Wabi. Well, yeah, I was just going to – I just wanted AJ's commentary, though, on – how easy I thought Seattle made it look like, like they almost just made it look like this was practice and it was ones versus threes. And again, not an indictment on the Vikings. I'm just complimenting Russell Wilson. Yeah. I mean, you could even credit the Minnesota Vikings who got Russell and the Seahawks into a fourth and long situation. I forget exactly what it was, uh, but it was a fourth and long situation. And that really was the play that, that broke the situation. Um, yeah. I believe it was Cam Dantzler got spun around and DK Metcalf just went up and caught it wide open for that first down to extend that drive and really get them some momentum moving towards the goal line. Uh, and then, you know, clearly another fourth down conversion at the end there. And, you know, it is what it is. Do you guys yeah. feel like they changed <clears throat> that game really felt a lot like to me, one of the like late 90s, early aughts versions of the Vikings where they would be dominating on defense for most of the game and then they would go into like a prevent and just let the team march down the field. He's usually far, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, did they change anything that they were doing um, defensively on that last drive? I know they had those two high safeties the entire game that were for somehow uh, befuddling uh wilson for the most part but do you think that i I just i'm trying to figure out what the hell happened or what was so different uh on that last drive to allow them to essentially walk down the field with with 
I, I want to say relative ease because they did get him into fourth down a couple times, like you guys said. But, I mean, did they change what they did? They do more of a, a relaxed form of what they were doing. And is that something you could pin on, on the coaching staff? Um, AJ, I know, you know, you, you know, you, you're around folks like Ben Lieber and um, who may have different thoughts. And I don't know what you thought, but to me, I, I thought the plan the Vikings had in the first half and, and was really good. And Joe, you, you referenced the two high safeties. I mean, to me, I saw a lot of cover two or cover four, um, you know, which um, is basically the Vikings were playing coverage and they did a great job and Russell Wilson didn't have options. And, um, you know, I don't know if they played a more relaxed version of that down the stretch, Joe, but I, I do know that when the opponent needs a touchdown to win the game, there's just, there's there's a certain level of responsibility you have to have as a defensive play caller where you just can't be as aggressive as you were for most of the game because you can't give up big chunk plays. And if they're going to drive 11, 12, 13 plays and beat you, you know, kudos to them for doing that. Yeah. But you don't want to make it easy on them by having a single high safety and bringing pressure and then have them get over the top on you. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they changed a whole lot, to be honest with you. I mean, we forget sometimes. Um, you know, as Minnesota Vikings fans, we put a lot of blame on the Minnesota Vikings and the Minnesota Vikings coaching staff, but we forget that there's two sides to a coin and two yeah. sides to um, the adjustments that get made on the football field. And I think it was more Seattle making adjustments, clearly in that third quarter when they busted out 21 points. Um, like but then again, minutes. on that last drive, right? Yeah. Uh, that last drive again, too, the, the Vikings didn't change a whole lot of what they were doing. They they were pretty conservative, um, having the, the, the coverage over the top just to kind of bottle up anything that could open up on the backside and and kept everything in front of them. And I think that there were just some some uh, momentary uh, momentary uh, individual lapses of coverage that Russ saw. Um, yeah. which he maybe he wasn't seeing earlier. Uh, it felt like he was moving a little bit more in the second half, running with the ball, moving the pocket a little bit. That gives him some different angles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that Seattle made some adjustments and it, it wasn't necessarily, I wouldn't put it on the coaching staff as I would maybe just here or there. And I don't think it's on one player. Clearly everyone made mistakes, but here or there, um, a momentary lapse of coverage, um, I can't imagine how hard it is to play defense in the NFL with all the rules stacked against you. You're reacting when the offensive player is, is, is dictating where they're going. Yeah. Um, that's a hard thing to do. And sometimes you just, you, you can't cover someone like a glove every single time. And it, it, the quarterback has to see it. And Russell saw it. And I think they just took advantage of those opportunities. If anything, they, they on some of the plays on the, that final drive, they were rushing three guys. Uh, the Vikings were obviously, um, they, they were, kind of not as aggressive in some of the, the blitzes and things uh, that they were doing earlier in the game. And I felt like that, <clears throat> I, I don't know, I feel like the reason I thought the show was a good balance is because Wobby's a little bit more optimistic and I'm always looking for the most negative possible angle for whatever reason. <laughs> and uh, I, my thought was, wow, when things were going good in that game, like this is what an aggressive play calling game looks like from Zimmer like I haven't it reminded me of when Zimmer first got here and I think he was he had, didn't have as many players in place to really run the system that he wanted to like he did in the last couple seasons and so it was it was refreshing but also a little bit aggravating to say well th th if the Vikings are playing basically to win as opposed to playing not to lose and they're just pinning their ears back and they're rushing everybody and you're getting you know Eric Wilson's getting sacks and, and lots uh just lots of different looks. Um, I, I felt like it was something that, considering the, the fixes that this defense needs, really are just going to come with time, uh, something that they could build on moving forward in this season. And, and while it might have taken a lot of wind out of their sails to end up losing that game as a young defense, um, don't, I mean, AJ, what do you think about bringing some of what they did in that game to this weekend and moving forward? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you, one of the things you mentioned was Zimmer's early years when he didn't quite have the personnel that he had in Cincinnati when he was really rolling on all cylinders and could could do what he wanted because he had brought new people in. That was one of the first things he did was bring in new bodies that fit his scheme. 
Um, you know, find a guy that can can plug up the middle on the defensive line. Find a, 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 a linebacker that can drop in coverage, rush the quarterback, and, you know, do all those things. Uh, and then obviously, you know, have some guys over the top. And and what you, what you have to do, and I'm glad to see them do this, um, rather than try and fit a square peg through a round hole and and have players who aren't able and capable of doing that because they're young, because they're naive, and, and, and they haven't been in the system long enough, um, they're they're adapting and they're adjusting a little bit. And a lot of the sacks that we saw felt like coverage sacks where yeah. the pocket just collapsed because Russell couldn't find anybody to get the ball to. Um, and if, if you can do that, you know, Seattle, they're a really good team, but they do have their flaws. Um, Atlanta has a lot of flaws as well. Um, they have injuries as well. So if, if you can continue to do that for sure this weekend and, and, and on into the, the rest of the season, um, that's the adaptation that you need to do to stay competitive. Now, I don't think that this football team is good enough to um, you know, blow teams out of the water. They're going to have games where they have to be competitive and they have to keep it close and they have to keep it within striking distance because we've seen this team get down by um, double digits early in a game and they, for whatever reason, change the game plan and, and they can't dig themselves out of those holes. So if they can do what they did, um, to put some pressure on without needing to be super aggressive and super risky, that's the best case scenario for this particular personnel group. Uh, and then you, then your offense is dynamic. Your offense can score points. It's just a question of whether the defense can stop the other team or not. Yeah, you know, I think, um, AJ, you hit on a lot of really good points. And I wanted to go back to something, you know, that Joe was talking about with regard to this defense. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, this, this might be spin zone a little bit and, and me putting a positive spin on it, but I'm, I don't need to do this. If, if, if I didn't feel this, I, I wouldn't say it. I would focus on something else. Um, I, I really do see what Zinn is doing with this defense. And I've, I've talked about it before. Like this is round two of a Zimmer defense with the Minnesota Vikings round one started in 2014 when he took over and Everson became a starter and captain Muller, Munnerlin and Linval Joseph were signed and uh, Xavier Rhodes developed um, drafted bar Kendricks and Waynes like that was version one of this and it went through its entire life cycle. And now this is the second life cycle. This is round two of a Zimmer defense. And he, he's, he's almost starting over from scratch. Yes, you have Harrison Smith, you've kept Kendricks and Barr, and you have Daniil Hunter hopefully some, sometime soon. Other than that, though, they're starting over. So when I see mistakes and when this defense plays poorly, yes, it's not good and they're playing poorly. But the mistakes are born of inexperience and they're born of starting over. They're not born of insufficient talent lack of direction, and no vision. Um, so that's the good news for this defense, and I think it has a chance to round into form. So um, I, I don't think that this week is going to be a great test uh, for that theory. Um, I think that the Vikings um, are very high probability winners this week against the Falcons. But I think in two weeks against the Packers, you're going to get a great opportunity to gauge this theory because this defense was absolutely exposed for what it was in week one, which was inexperienced in terms of playing together um, and very young. And let's see how, how much they've grown since week one and how much they learn from week one when they play the Packers once again in, in a couple weeks. And it's interesting because if you look at um... – some of these more advanced statistics like uh, the new es- whatever that new es- ESPN statistical barometer I think it's called something like uh, football power index or something um, or like just like websites like football outsiders they have the the Vikings in terms of DVOA is the 11th to 12th best team in um, the NFL they're actually rated above uh, a few teams with three and two records and two teams with four and one records in the Bears and the Browns and <clears throat> speaking of mistakes if you look at the the before halftime with the Packers um, where they there was just that huge point swing and all that momentum went out the window then you start the, the second quarter against the Seahawks and it's just a disaster Cousins throws that that very uh, wishful thinking interception. I mean, I, I give him credit for bouncing back and, and kind of not, you know, uh, falling apart after after giving up, you know, three touchdowns in two minutes or whatever. But um, where do you guys really feel this team is? Because it's hard to say where 
I, I for, for me personally, what to expect. I mean, they're going down to the wire against the Seahawks, one of the consensus, you know, top three to five teams, depending on who you ask in the NFL. Um, they have all this talent on offense. Knock on wood, Dalvin will, will be back soon. Um, uh, the, the, uh, you would think that just as they stand now, or even with, I don't know, a, a cardboard cutout of Steve Hutchinson playing uh, right guard for – for Drew Samia, <laughs> that they'd actually, this team is not that far away from from even being a playoff team, especially with the the additional wild card teams that are that are uh, available or wild card spots that are available um, this season and moving forward. I mean, Wabi, where do you, how do you after watching that game, especially? I know I kind of asked you this last week. What do you, how do you, how do we peg this team? Yeah, I mean, uh, when two three weeks ago when we were looking at the Vikings schedule I'm just like I mean they're not beating Tennessee maybe they can beat Houston and they're not beating Seattle you know well they damn near beat Tennessee and they came even closer to beating Seattle and they did beat Houston so I'm looking at a team that's going to play I know they're going to play the Packers in two weeks but I'm also looking at a schedule that has games against the Falcons who stink the Lions who stink the Bears who are not as good as their record says they are the Cowboys who are wounded the Panthers who are beatable the Jaguars who are beatable and Tampa Bay who I don't know what they are and then Chicago again like these are games the Vikings can win these are not games like at Seattle and playing Tennessee I mean, these are games they're all going to ha- probably have a good chance to win. So I'm not ruling the Vikings out. As as ominous as 1-4 and four traditionally is in the NFL, especially in the NFC North and the NFC in the last few seasons, which has been very competitive, I see a very soft schedule. And I'm not naive enough to ever think a game is easy. And if you don't think a game is easy, you can't think a schedule is easy. So I'm not going to call it an easy schedule. I'm just going to call it soft. I see some games the Vikings can win. And I've been through so many Vikings seasons covering the team where it has been an absolute meat grinder of a schedule. And that is not the schedule. This is a soft schedule for the next two months. Yeah, I remember the Packers when I was in college. They started two and four. They ended up making the playoffs. I think that was one of the years where the Vikings were like six and zero or five and one to start the season. Then they didn't make the playoffs both times. Um, uh, take that, uh, Mr. Monsoor, one way or the other. I mean, are, do you think the playoff hopes are, are dead, or just more generally as a concept? Like, what are your expectations week to week with these 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 guys? Yeah, um, I don't know how you guys are going to take this, but I guess I don't think it matters. Um, this is a team that kind of is what it is and what we've seen so far. And if they do, you know, ride this pipe dream and make the playoffs, I I think it's a one and done kind of a situation. So what does it matter? I guess, you know, every team likes to make the playoffs in a weird year like this, where it's not like the fans get another game to go to the team's not going to make, you know, they'll make TV money, but they're not going to, you know, fill the stadium or potentially get a home game or, or anything cool like that. Um, I, I just, I, I don't see, you know, I don't think they have the, 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 the skill to make a run in the playoffs. And, and that kind of gets me in a spot where, you know, the way I've treated the season so far has been interesting. Um, generally I'm a very optimistic guy, try to find the positive side of things. I, I was a, you know, tank for Trevor, not necessarily Trevor, cause you're not going to get Trevor cause New York is terrible, but I, I'm sick of this team throughout most of our lifetimes we're all about the same age getting you know the 7 to 15 range draft pick yeah um clearly you can make great decisions and a lot of great players have come from that range and well beyond it um but the way i looked at it early when they were losing this game these games is you know you are rebuilding you know whether we like it or not you're you're rebuilding it may not be a full rebuild but it might be a half rebuild and if you can get a better player and, you know, I, I trust the the decision makers behind the scenes here. Um, they haven't had a perfect record, but I trust what they're doing. I think they know what they're doing and what they're looking for. And if you can have an opportunity to get the top offensive lineman left tackle, if you can have an opportunity, you know, if you're one of the people that says get a quarterback and maybe you don't get Trevor Lawrence, but you can get Trey Lance or Justin Fields or or, or one of the other guys. Um, you have that opportunity there too. Um, I, for me, it was more of a, 
you know, this season's going to be a wash one way or another. We're not yeah. going to the Super Bowl. We're not going to make a deep run. If you make the playoffs, it's going to be a one and done kind of situation. So get a get a draft pick and make this team better in the future. A macro versus micro kind of mindset is how I was looking at it. Um, that being said, you you do look at this schedule, like Wabi said, and the back end is a lot easier than the front end. And you had a very, very good chance to come out of this front end, you know, before your bye at three and three. If not four and two, I mean, you take Tennessee to the brink, you take Seattle to the brink, you win one of those games, assuming we win this weekend and you go into that bye at three and three and you feel a lot better about playoff chances at three and three with a soft schedule ahead of you than you do at, you know, two and four or whatever, you know, you, you, you have a different feeling there. So I continue to kind of feel like this is going to be one of those seasons where we end up in the middle, middle of the first round draft pick. You know, the second round pick is is gone with Ngakwe. So, you know, you have that. You got some extra picks on the back end. Um, and, and that doesn't excite me, I guess, is is the moral of my story. Yeah. It would excite me if you had a top five pick. It doesn't yeah. excite me as much if you have seven to 15. And that's I, just kind of what we've always had. I've said this on a couple of the the guest, or the radio shows that I guessed on during this week that it would have been nice to beat Seattle. But towards the end of the season, uh, looking back, it would have been like, man, we it would have probably been better just to lose that game. I mean, I think, yeah, like you said, we're all the same age, probably mid thirties, and, and um, our, our entire lives, the Vikings have have been decently good. You know, a top five team historically in, in regular season winning percentage. So they never end up getting that really good pick outside of uh, Matt Khalil, I guess. Um, and but so even it, that, remember that, remember that season was a worthless win against the Redskins yes, at the end of the year. Joe, Joe Webb, and, right? You had an opportunity there. You know, we weren't going to get Andrew Luck, but look at the haul. Was it the Rams that traded out of that number two spot with Washington and got just a haul of draft picks and yeah. players for that for Robert Griffin III? Yeah, that could have been the situation there. And you won a worthless game at the end of the season. Yeah, um, you know that that's kind of how the the feeling there that I feel. Yeah. yeah. Yep, I, I I'm with you guys and and kind of what I think of when I hear, when I'm listening to you guys talk about this where where the Vikings are is no man's land that, that's what it is like if you have Kirk Cousins if you have Philip Rivers if you have Matthew Stafford for the cow like one of my favorite players to watch ever was Tony Romo but this applies to Tony Romo you are in no man's land you are right. good good enough to be right where AJ says you're gonna be borderline playoff team every year you're not good enough to win the Super Bowl, and you're never bad enough to get Andrew Luck. You're never bad enough to get, um, you know, one of these quarterbacks that's almost a no-brainer. You know, and so the really when you're that team, your only ray of hope is to be a team like like to think about teams that get their franchise quarterback like in the middle of the first round, which is not exactly common. But like you know, Patrick Mahomes, what was he tenth? I think. Yeah. 10th overall but yeah. in that situation the Chiefs were like at the 25th pick I think and they traded up you know so um yeah the Vikings are in no man's land basically and and until you get the guy on a rookie contract you are a team that's in no man's land the only team right now that's at the top of the league that is not what I'm talking about um that is a no man's land team is the Titans they have Ryan Tannehill like that's amazing. They're four and zero with Ryan Tannehill. They went to the AFC title game last year with Ryan Tannehill. That's somehow they did that. I don't whatever. But like the Seahawks, you know Russell Wilson. They got a guy. Obviously the Packers and Rodgers, the Chiefs and Mahomes, um, Josh Allen in Buffalo was a first like was a first round pick, a franchise guy. Like you didn't go out and get that guy in free agency. You got that guy in the draft and. Um, you know, that's just kind of where, where the Vikings are right now is they're in no man's land. And it's kind of a shame because since 2014 with Zimmer, they've got a guy and a coach who really knows how to put together a defense, you know, and if you paired them up with a franchise quarterback, which they did when they had Teddy, it, they were going to be in business, you know, but then obviously what happened with Teddy happened and that's just sort of the Vikings luck. Where are you guys at on, on your, your feelings? Um, about Cousins, you know, I felt that, especially after the first two weeks, I thought, why extend Cousins to the tune of a guaranteed forty-five million the second next season starts for the season after that, if you're going to be in this heavy of a rebuild to the point that you're not even, I mean, trying to 
to you know, maybe bring Josh Klein back or go out and get snacks Harrison for practice squad money. Um, but it seems like he's bounced back, I guess, in the best Cousins way possible. He, he's distributed the ball better. I mean, the line has been uh, borderline atrocious in pass protection per usual. You have Drew Samia with four holding penalties, three of which stuck last week. Um, he, you know, I don't know. I, I, I am a very big Cousins uh, Homer, so I'll just get that out there. I mean, I, I was probably the first person in Vikings media to shout angrily to sign Cousins, but that was with the understanding that they would replace Berger and Easton uh, in the draft of free agency, which they still haven't done, to be completely honest. Um, but do you think he deserves a little bit of, of uh, credit for the way that this offense has bounced back these last couple of weeks, or do you, do you put that more on the play of the people around him and then Kubiak uh, remembering that he was Kubiak, AJ? Yeah, let me start by saying I like Kirk. Um, I like him as a person. I think he has talent because everything I'm going to say after this will make it sound like I don't like Kirk. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I like him, but he needs to be in the right situation. And it needs to be, when I say the right situation, I mean like the perfect situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I look at Indianapolis and I see a team where Kirk Cousins would be a, a perennial deep into playoffs kind of a guy. You have a solid defense and you have an offensive line that can protect you consistently. That's what right now he doesn't have here in Minnesota. Um, clearly the, the offensive line isn't there and hasn't been there since he's been here. Um, the defense you know, has been better in the past, but still has had lapses. Um, and this year obviously is leaving a lot to be desired. Um, what, what the biggest flaw I see in Kirk's game, which gets him into trouble and really puts all the doubters on a, a pedestal is when the game gets out of hand, he can't handle it. He doesn't have the ability to adapt. He doesn't have the ability to, you know, think on his toes. And if if the game plan that they came to the table with, A, doesn't work, or B, is thrown out the window because you get down too early, he, he doesn't have the ability, like Aaron Rodgers, to dig yourself out of a hole really quickly. He doesn't have the same ability he has a little bit of a of a of a you know move the pocket ability, but not the way that Russell Wilson has. Not the way, and I'm I'm talking to high level examples. I understand that. I'm not comparing him point to point with Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson. Well, he but, gets paid like it, so that's not incredibly sure, un- but unfair. That kind of a that kind of a player, um, th- those guys can adapt, and they do, and they they have comeback victories, and they have blowout victories because of it. If if Kirk gets up. Kirk can can hold a lead. If Kirk is in a shootout, you know uh, that that is close throughout the game. Kirk can can handle that. But if Kirk gets down, he he can't pull himself out of there because he doesn't have the perfect situation around him. So, again, I think Kirk could be a really good quarterback in a team that is a, like a veteran team with solid players on both sides of the football. And right now, he doesn't have that here in Minnesota. I agree with a lot of that. I, I think at the end of the day. And I agree with the part that AJ said about Kirk as a guy. I mean, I, we were both around him. AJ, how do you not like the guy? Of right. course, of course, you like the guy. He's a great guy. He's a dork, I, but he's a great guy. <laughs> I, right. I would not have extended him. I understand that maybe they got some sort of cap relief this season by extending him. That's my guess. But I would rather yeah. take my medicine and deal with the cap relief. That's the price you pay for going out and getting him in free agency. Uh, I would not have extended him because I think his number in future years puts the Vikings in a tough spot. And what I would rather have seen the Vikings do is not extend him, have this be the last year of his deal, and at 22, take Jordan Love and have Jordan Love sit for a year behind veteran Kirk Cousins and watch. Um, Now, do you lose Justin Jefferson? Probably um, because, uh, I see at 25, San Francisco took a wide receiver. So let's, let's suppose the Niners would have taken Jefferson, but you would have gotten Brandon Ayuk, And I think he looks pretty good. And I think the difference, uh, the downgrade from Jefferson to Ayuk is not as severe as the problem. The Vikings will now have at quarterback in future years. So, um, I, I much rather would have seen the Vikings invest in a young quarterback in this draft than extend Kirk Cousins. I, I think that was a mistake, and I think that um, that lengthens their time in no man's land, in quarterback sure. no man's land. And, and, and 
again, not an indictment on Cousins. I think he's got ability and talent and whatever, but like he, he's not your quarterback for, for 10 more years, and Jordan Love might have been. Yeah, and a lot of people that were talking about firing Zimmer after week two of the season, I think he was like the fourth highest rated coach on some of these betting websites for the first coach to get fired in 2020. The reality of that situation was what young up and coming coaching prospect would want to come to this team as currently comprised. You have Cousins locked in for two more years. Um, You have a, a lot of young guys that were drafted to fill Zimmer's system specifically. Um, you know, you have Spielman, who's got a lot of power. Um, it just, it didn't seem like a realistic move because I mean, again, things have turned around a little bit, but I think you guys are right. It's the, the analogy I keep thinking of is like cousins is like trying to create a a, a salt water fish tank at your house. Like everything has to be, you have to check it every day with pH strips and then everything dies anyway. Like it just has to be so specifically perfect for him to do his thing that it's like, that doesn't scream to me. Uh, someone to rebuild the team around. That's uh, smartly why I think Cousins turned down more money from the Jets because he realized they still need needed about you know ten other guys around him for him to not become a pariah in the biggest you know sports media market in the country. Uh, so that's um, uh, it was smart on his behalf. But I, yeah, again, I feel like we're just going to be in this weird purgatory for the next couple se- seasons unless something dramatic happens. Um, I, I like where Kubiak's going with this. I like how they're distributing the ball. Um, but I, I just, you guys have a lot more access to the team than I do. And I've, I've asked you this last week, Wabi, so I'll kick it to AJ. Why don't that, what is the aversion from your point of view uh, in regards to just bringing in guards? Like, they, okay, I, I understand Klein wasn't the prototypical guy they want to fit from, a, from an athleticism standpoint, but he at least was some sort of semblance of a positive thing to build around with him, uh, Bradbury and O'Neal on the right side, especially in the run game last year. Um, they have uh, Brett Jones on the roster. You think he would be better than... I mean, Samia's playing historically bad, and that's saying something considering Remmers was the guy a couple seasons ago. Like, I don't get... I said this last... I had just think that maybe Zimmer got bullied by the, the guard on his high school football team, and he's just hated them ever since or something. You know, it's just like, why, why won't he... Why won't they just make that move? Why don't they draft guys? Why do they always try to bring tackles over? Uh, so on and so forth. I mean, in regards to Samia, they, there's articles out there saying they can't play him. Like, they can't go another week with him. Collinsworth is, was saying things that was embarrassing as a fan to hear um, Sunday night. So, yeah, I mean, just in general, what 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 the hell, man, is the question. Right. Um, you know, I guess I can't lend a whole lot of credence to the decisions that they've made behind with the personnel decisions as far as um, picking these guys, why they did, why they move them over from, from tackles or whatever. But I, I think, you know, clearly these decisions have been dictated based on um, salary cap restrictions because of cousins, because of, you know, re- resigning guys like Anthony Barr and Dalvin cook. And, you know, you make your, you have to make a decision and, and choose whether you want to go one way or the other. And they've made some decisions, drawn a line in the sand, and that left them shorthanded in other spots. And it feels like they've been shorthanded on the offensive line for about eight years, um, <laughs> trying to build through the draft, not being able to do so. Um, I mean, if there's one glaring deficiency on Rick Spielman's draft card, it, it's it's offensive line, and specifically, yep. um, you know, on the outside. There's there's been a glimmer of hope at, at center once or twice with with a couple guys, but. Um, you know, uh, Brian O'Neill is, is been a good situation. He came on quicker than we thought he would even, um, you know, that when you talk about Samia specifically, I think that there is this fear in professional sports across the board. You hear it in baseball with pitchers, you hear it, um, you know, in, 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 um, in hockey with guys that you're bringing up and bringing down. Um, you don't really have that opportunity as much in football. Um, you can bench a guy, um, but there there's mental side to this that that needs to be considered too. And I I, I would say that they know the mental capacity of of the guys on their roster better than we do. Um, and and you know waving the white flag after three weeks, waving the white flag after four weeks, um, might send a signal to a, a rookie that you know we're done with you. And, you know, no matter where you were drafted, we we can't afford to have you out there. And it takes a special person to overcome that, um, especially midseason. I mean, if it's an offseason thing and you have time to find a mentor and really talk about it and, and work your way through it, 
and have some time away from the game. Um, but if you were to do it right now, and they are to the point now where they 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 have to make a decision, um, they're going to continue just to 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 throw him out there and and avoid him, <laughs> go the other direction every yeah. time, um, move the pocket, you know, do those sorts of things that you can do to adapt. Um, but at the same time, you know, if if he sits there and he has to watch the rest of the season from the sidelines, it takes a toll. And it takes a different toll on every person. And, and I don't I don't know what kind of effect it's going to have on him. And if they have high hopes for him long term, you know, it, that, that may have an impact there, too. I don't know. Zimmer said that, you know, with the double teams that they're helping him with, he gets a little too overexcited or over aggressive. And that's where the holding penalties come in with his hands. Um, and other than that, his position uh, and, and I think his um, form is from what Zimmer said is also not great. Um so I just it's again people pining for Pat Elfline to come back is probably the most Vikings thing I've I've heard in the last couple of years considering you know what I mean but yeah sorry Wabi I just wanted to throw that out there. No no it's all good you look I think to understand maybe the um the strategy or decision to keep playing Samia I think is it's very similar to if your opinion. Okay, so the way I laid out the Vikings defense, where these mistakes that are happening are happening because of inexperience, but I, you start you're starting to see it come together, and like you see what the vision is here, and it's not because of a lack of talent, it's not because of a lack of vision, it's just a lack of experience. And but so if that's your your vision or your your view on Samia, I can understand why they're playing him. What I can't, what I wouldn't understand is if they, if they are just like, oh my, oh my, oh my God, just Samia Kid's terrible, but you know Ezra Cleveland's just not ready yet. If that's the opinion, that I have a hard time with because I saw him do that with Stephon Diggs. I saw them not play Stephon Diggs in his rookie season, even though he was lighting everybody up in practice because they just thought he wasn't ready. And then finally, there were enough injuries at the wide receiver position where they had to play Diggs. And look what happened. So I, I just don't I don't like when at the pro level a lack of experience is cited for someone not playing. Because yeah. how are they supposed to get experience if you don't play them? And, like, and Jefferson's it's an like, example of that too, right? The first two weeks of yes. Justin Jefferson or even play, Brian O'Neill. I mean, Brian O'Neill people thought was a two to three year project, like um AJ alluded yeah. to, and he came out of the, the his first year just gangbusters. So I I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean I maybe flipping Cleveland and some of the quotes from Kubiak before training camp about about Cleveland, you know, trying to break uh, his him going back to what he's comfortable with. We have to get him out of that. Um, that's yeah. because he's never played guard before. So of course he's going to go back to what he's comfortable with because that's why you drafted yep. him, I guess. Um, uh, so let's uh, really quickly, we'll get into your guys' thoughts on the Falcons game. I know we're going over a little bit. Uh, we can kind of omit some of the injury stuff. But uh, speaking of injuries, I wanted to mention that uh, this show is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped uh, wants you to know that autumn is in the air, and they are here to ensure that you don't carve your pumpkins when you're grooming. And then by pumpkins, we actually mean your boys downstairs. I don't know why they had to clarify that. Uh, in fact, Manscaped is on a mission to change the way you approach caring for your balls. And great news, they just released their products in the UK, Canada, and Australia. Um, they have all sorts of great products. You get 20% off if you use the discount code 3DEEP, the number 3, the word DEEP, one word. And you get free shipping as well. Uh, check out their new Weed Whacker uh, for your ear, nose, and upper back, I, I would guess. I don't know. Either way... Um, now that I feel incredibly uncomfortable, let's get into the Falcons game. I mean, this is the, the sort of game where you would have to think, I, uh, I don't want to say it's a must win because I'm, I'm on the same page as you, um, AJ, and I know, Wabi, you agreed too, that it, what, it doesn't really matter that much um, in the grand scheme of things uh, from a team-building perspective. But, you know, there, there seems to be some positive things to, to, to look at and, and look forward to each week and it would be surprising coming off that Seattle game if if the Vikings were inept against this Falcons team especially considering how bad Matt Ryan's uh, historically been against the Zimmer led Vikings team I mean are we all kind of on the same page there Wabi you think this should be uh, somewhat of an easy win which is a weird thing to say for a one and four team yeah I mean I um with what Atlanta's going through, change in leadership, and they're winless, and Julio's hurt, and um, 
you know, COVID and not practicing and yeah. traveling the minute. I just, I, I don't know. I mean, nothing's, it's never easy in this league, but uh, not, not to be too simple about this, but I mean, yeah, this is the Vikings. Let's roll the ball out on the field. The Vikings will probably win the game. Yeah. I mean, this on paper is one of those games that you should win, but um, so was that Buffalo game a couple of years back. And so uh, is every game we play against the Chicago bears and, you know, weird <laughs> things happen. Um, Wabi will know this better than any of us uh, with the, the, his proximity to the team um, in years past. The, the reason why I hope they win is covering this team, paying attention to this team becomes a bit of a drag. If, if, rumors start swirling towards the end of a season that's a a hopeless and wasted season and Mm -hmm. the players start getting crabby and snippy because they're hearing what the people in the media are saying and that's when it becomes not fun to to cover this team and you know i would prefer it to be fun (laughs) i would prefer it to not be a a a pain in the butt um you know this again I, i do think it's it there's not a whole lot of of high aspirations for this season but at the same time unless you're, you know, again, the middle of the road to the bottom half of the league is, is when it just gets weird, you know, week eight and you're talking about, you know, what we're going to do next year and planning for the future and, yeah. and all that. It's just, a, it's a little too early. And then you do it for eight more weeks and it just wears on everybody. It wears yeah, on the players. After it wears week on the two for this team, right? You know, so for I sure. get what you're saying. So when you, when you say must win, I guess I, I see it as a must win in that sense. Yeah. Just to keep the morale up a little bit. Um, but again, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it's a must win as far as, you know, if, if they want to make the playoffs, it is a must win, but I just, I've, I've, I've made my case there. So I think it's a very winnable game. Um, but this is the, this team is capable of laying a giant egg. Yeah. And, the, and if you look at like overall offensive statistics, the Falcons are, you know, top 10, um, in regards right. to a few things, they run the third most, plays, be dangerous. Third most yeah, pass attempts, even though Julio has been banged up. Um, you know, so they're not, uh, horrible, um, either. I mean, they, they have some, uh, some talent on the offensive side of the ball, assuming people, uh, I mean, Julio's probably not going to play, so that's a relatively big deal, but I, you know, this is the first season since I started Purple PTSD in 2015, where you, we weren't going into it, at least I wasn't, I know a lot of people, uh, other people were saying the Vikings were going to be 12 and 4 and go to the Super Bowl, but that it wasn't like one more piece away from the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? It's just a completely different landscape. And I think that it is important to have something positive week to week to build on. And I do see some, some semblance of a uh, plan moving forward in the future. That isn't just as atrocious as everything seemed after uh, week one or two. So I guess that's where we're at. Um, you know, that's, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens this weekend. And then, and you know, cause the, the Falcons have played the Packers, and the Bears, uh, they lost to both of them, uh, one by four points, one by two touchdowns. So it is a good barometer before the bye. And then obviously the Packers game will give us a good sense on any improvement from week one. But uh, I think that's a good place to uh, finish the show. Um, I know, Wabi, you have your your Friday sort of uh, mixtape article coming out mm-hmm. tomorrow. And then uh, you guys can find AJ uh, basically everywhere. He's like Ultron from the Avengers comics uh, at AJ K fan on Twitter. And uh, obviously at K fan you, and you write for us uh, now too, which is pretty cool. Um, you have an uh, article coming. I think the next one will be next Monday. Yeah, I'll probably get one up before then actually. So I'll, I'm going to try and squeeze out two a week. So we'll uh, get one either tomorrow or, or leading up to the game Saturday, Sunday. So we'll get, we'll get another one in there. Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for stopping by. We'll get you back on the show hopefully in the, the next, I don't know, six to eight weeks. Uh, and I want to remind everyone to go to manscaped.com, use discount code 3DEEP, the number three, the word DEEP, one word, and you get 20% off, plus free shipping on your first or next article. Uh, thanks for stopping by, guys. We'll, uh, we'll see how things go on Sunday. Sounds good, Joe. Thanks a lot. Hey, AJ, good chat, uh, chatting with you again. Good to chat with you, Wabi. All right. See you guys.